Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. O mankind, fear your Lord. The quake of the hour is a thing terrible. On the day you witness it, every nursing woman shall be distracted from what she nurses. Every pregnant woman shall deliver what she carries. And you shall see mankind drunk. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of all the worlds. Welcome, Cosmic Explorers, to Part 4, Season 2 of Allah and the Cosmos, where we will uncover new dimensions through space and time. If you are new to the channel, we advise you to watch all of the episodes of Allah and the Cosmos in order from Season 1 Part 1, Creation in 6 Days, or some content may not make sense. In this episode of Allah and the Cosmos, we will dive deep into the chapter of the people of the cave, and why Allah linked this particular event to the Dajjal, who is also known as the Antichrist. The Dajjal is one of the 10 major signs of the hour. The Cave is a miraculous story about a group of young believing men that has and will quench our thirst for knowledge for generations. But it's more than just a story about a special group of young men. It's also a story about time. Come with us, cosmic adventurers. We have breadcrumbs to follow. The Hour is very near, mere seconds in throne time. It's approaching. Allah says, He shall say, How long did you remain on earth in number of years? They will respond, We remained for a day or a part thereof. Ask those who count. He will say, You remained only a short while, if only you knew. We are here at the end of the sixth day, right next to the hour, which is the beginning of the seventh day. We are only here for a short while indeed. Now notice in the Quran, Allah never says the last hour. Allah only says two words, the hour. There is no mention of the word last in between these two words. There's no such thing as the last hour will commence. Why does Allah do that? Why not say the last hour and not just the hour? What's the difference? Well, it's a miracle in itself because if Allah were to say the last hour, that would not make any sense because we are already within the last hour. We are here, the last hour of the sixth day of creation. And the hour that Allah talks about will strike at the commencement of the seventh day, judgment day. Look at Allah's signs about throne time. So simple, yet the signs are incredible, if you know where to look. So there's no such thing as the final hour or the last hour. There is just this, the hour. And it will not commence until all the ten major signs have come to pass. And the first of the ten is the coming of Dajjal, the Antichrist. The Dajjal is going to be the most difficult trial for mankind on the face of the earth. But we are told there is a chapter. A chapter if we were to recite every Friday and recite it when the Dajjal emerges, Allah will protect us from the Antichrist. What is this chapter in the Quran that is said to protect us from the Dajjal? The cave. Have you ever thought why, by reciting this chapter and only this chapter, Allah will protect people from the Dajjal? What has the Dajjal got to do with the story of the cave? Does this chapter even have any mention of the Antichrist? No. In fact, Dajjal is never mentioned in the Quran at all. So why this chapter? You would think there must be a reason. So what's the relation to this chapter then? The chapter of the cave consists of four stories. The first one is about the people of the cave. Then Allah speaks about the men with the two gardens. Then the tale about the man of knowledge with Musa alayhi salam, and then finally the story of Dulkarnain and Gog and Magog. 
We do find it interesting that another major sign is in this chapter, Gog and Magog. But we'll talk about that in another episode, inshallah. Right now, we are very interested in the first story. Why only the first story? Well, the chapter itself is named after it, so that indicates it's the most important story out of the four. And also, the Prophet ﷺ said to recite the first few verses of the chapter as protection from the Dajjal. That would include the story of the cave. Okay, hold on tight, explorers, because we are about to go on a cosmic adventure through time. First, let's visit the past. Idolatry was rampant at the time. Only a small group of people were guided aright. They were believers, believers of the one true God. But if they utter it, they will be persecuted, possibly crucified by the Romans. To seek refuge from a tyrant king, Allah guides these believers to a cave, a very special cave. These young men come into the cave along with their dog. Allah puts them into a deep, deep sleep, including the dog. And when they wake, little do they know that it's been over 300 years. Allah says that nine more years were added to these 300 years. Why? Allah takes into account both solar and lunar years. In solar years it would be 300 years, and in lunar years it's close to 309 years, which Allah adds only Allah knows how long they remained. So this means that these years are not exact. So what's the lesson? What's the point of this story? Well, besides the fact that this story is super cool and awesome, the link is, the trial of Dajjal will be the biggest trial mankind will ever have to endure. At the time of Dajjal, the trial will be much like the trial of the people of the cave. And even worse, as it is said, that the Dajjal is the biggest trial on earth. Think of it like the final climb to reach the summit of Everest. It's the hardest part. Now this doesn't mean that the other test before this was easy, in no way. There were paths along the mountain that were lower but yet treacherous. For example, at the time of Pharaoh, or the people of the cave. But the summit, that last part, it will literally take every ounce of energy left to reach the top. And seeing as all the ten major signs are connected like beads falling off a necklace, when the summit is reached, the world will end. Time is up. The test is over. We are told that when the Dajjal emerges, we should go the other way. Literally run away because many people won't be able to not fall for his trap. And yes, this includes Muslims. So the first lesson from the chapter of the cave is very simple. Go and hide. But the bigger lesson is, never give up. Your faith is everything. Hold on tightly to it. Don't give in. Have faith that Allah will protect you. And with miracles if he wants to. Allah starts the chapter off with how amazing and unswerving the Quran is and that saying Allah has a son is blasphemy. So Allah talks about having faith in only him and hold on tight to the book that is free from distortion. And then Allah speaks about the people of the cave which obviously has a direct correlation with faith in trying times. So it is a direct command. When the Dajjal appears, go the other way. Don't even think about going towards the Dajjal. Hold on to your faith with a book that is completely unchanged and free from fault. Allah will protect you, even with things that you don't understand. Allah can do wonders, like make you go to sleep and wake you up 300 years later and you are still the same age as you were when you went to sleep and still alive to continue a life without the torment of a tyrant. So the story continues on. Allah wakes the young men to see what they say about how long they remained asleep. Allah says that he wanted to see which of the two groups were more accurate in terms of the time they had spent. So by default, Allah wants us 
to talk about this amazing occurrence, he wants us to question it. One of the men said, How long did you remain asleep? Others replied, A day or part of a day. So one group said a day and the other said part of a day. And then another person replied, Only Allah knows. We should gather up the money we have and one of us should go outside and get food because we are very hungry. Two groups differed on the time and someone among them said only Allah knows. Yes, only Allah knows how long they were asleep. But our Lord, at times, he shares this knowledge with us. And the way Allah shares this knowledge is often in the most amazing way. Sometimes it's right there in front of us, but we didn't look or ask the right question. When you think deeply about time, you automatically wonder, how do we measure time with the sun and the moon? Are any of these two celestial bodies mentioned in this verse? Yes, the sun. The sun is mentioned a few verses before this conversation takes place in chapter 18 when Allah says, and you would have seen the sun as it arose, veering away from their cave on the right, and as it set, cutting them out of its path on the left, they being in a cavity therein. That was a wonder of God. First of all, when Allah says that something was a wonder, this means that it was a miracle, something unexplainable. So the sun is doing something possibly outside our understanding of physics. For now, we do not know. We just know that the sun is doing something strange, rising and veering away from the cave. And when it sets, its rays still don't penetrate the cave. It's still away from the cave. How? Well, like we said, when Allah says that was a wonder, we hear and obey. We won't ask this how question because when Allah says the word wonder, it's Allah's miracle. It's basically Allah testing our faith. If we question this, we fear we may fail. So we won't question how the sun rose or set on this occasion. We don't know what happened or how, or how Allah caused it to happen, but we know it did happen. This may be unscientific to some skeptics, but it's only unscientific in our space and our time. Just like the splitting of the moon, Allah says that was a wonder. So that was not within the capability of our measurements within the laws of physics. That was a miracle and also a test of faith. We know Allah uses the laws of physics, which are in fact His laws of physics, to create and make things happen. And even though Allah can just say be and it is, Allah doesn't do that always. Because Allah is all wise and wants to show us how things work. And He wants us to ask questions and to think, discover and calculate. He allows things to happen naturally through time and space. Now I don't know about you, but I am very grateful that Allah has allowed mankind to discover things and ponder over the cosmos. For all we know, these miracles can be explained in another universe with different laws of physics. However, they can't be explained within the laws of physics in our universe. When Allah doesn't want us to do something or talk about something, Allah is always very clear about it. As mentioned with the word wonder, Allah also doesn't want us to speak about something else. If you read the chapter of the cave, there comes a point when Allah talks about how people are arguing about the number of these young men inside the cave. What was their number? If you read the verse, Allah says not to argue about that. Allah dislikes this. So we won't even say their number or what we think about their number. It's clearly not important. So Allah doesn't like us trying to explain miracles simply because it's way too complicated for our brains and for our universe. We just don't have the capability. And Allah doesn't like us talking about things that are too simple either. Like how many people were there? Or what was the color of the dog? So we will stay within our limits as we have no choice and within the knowledge that Allah has given to mankind. And we know mankind is very curious and Allah wants us to ponder over his verses unless Allah himself clearly says otherwise. So, we would rather talk about time travel. Yes, time travel. That is what's happening here. 
Which brings us to our first theory of the people of the cave, time dilation. The people of the cave traveled into the future, which Einstein said is absolutely possible. Traveling into the past is very difficult. We most likely need the energy of the entire universe, but into the future, it can definitely be done. And when Allah is in charge, well, you can imagine, past or future, it's nothing for the Lord of the worlds. He has infinite energy and all energy belongs to him. Anyway, back to the theory. So in this one verse, Allah seems to already give away the time spent, sunrise to sunset, just once. It doesn't seem like Allah is saying when the sun rises. He says when it arose. And Allah doesn't say when the sun sets. Instead, he says as it set. It's singular, one time. So, half a day. But that is only half a day inside the cave. What happened to the 309 years? Allah is possibly saying that for that group of young men, for their individual clocks, only part of a day had passed. But around them, over 300 years had passed by, relatively. It's what we call time dilation. When time passes, slower or faster depending on two things, speed and gravity, time is different for everyone and everything, and here time had passed more slowly for the people of the cave relative to the rest of the earth. Okay, so how? There are only two ways, speed or gravity. Are there any signs of either of these two ways in the Quran? Well, when Allah says that you would have imagined them to be awake as they slept on, and then said that they were turned from right side to left, how did Allah make them move? We don't know. Allah doesn't give us this knowledge. But what if Allah made their bodies move really, really fast? So fast that they were almost moving at the speed of light. What would happen to the space that they were on? Would the space not warp, creating some kind of wormhole? Because space and time are combined space-time. So their individual clocks would be moving very slowly compared to the rest of the earth. And moving that fast would make them lose consciousness, looking like they've fallen into a deep slumber. And also, if you were to walk in on them, you would run away in terror, because them moving that fast, they would literally look like ghosts. And what do people do when they see a ghost? They run. Okay, okay, hang on a minute before we get too excited. This is an exciting theory indeed, and as cool and awesome it would be that there was some kind of time dilation, a few important questions remain. Allah says that we sealed their ears for a number of years. Why would Allah seal their ears with this theory? So they couldn't hear? Well, they would lose consciousness and wouldn't be able to wake at that speed. So noise isn't a problem. Is it because of ear pressure? Well, ear pressure is almost always because of high altitude, so this doesn't add up. Another issue is, when the sleepers woke up, some seemed to be concerned about how long they slept, but it seems like hunger was a big issue, seen as that was mentioned in the Holy Quran, just how hungry the sleepers were. Would they feel intense hunger if they were moving at the speed of light but not really using any of their own energy, and they only slept for part of a day? Probably not. So why so hungry? And the main issue, the real reason why this theory isn't possible, Yes, travelling at the speed of light would cause them to move into the future, but without an appropriate suit or some kind of time machine protecting their bodies, they would surely die moving that fast or being shaken like that. And Allah did not mention any kind of machine here. If we look at the checklist for the factors Allah had put into place for the event to occur, not all the boxes are ticked. So, maybe there's a simpler explanation. Which brings us to our second theory, human hibernation. So this theory about hibernation, a state of deep sleep to conserve energy. Animals do it, plants do it, and humans haven't figured out the human hibernation yet, but there are people actually trying to do this. Maybe this is what is happening here inside the cave, a deep slumber 
they would still be time traveling, of course, just not as fast. Their ears are sealed, so they don't hear any noise to wake them up. And did you know, when animals wake up after hibernation, the first thing they think about is food, because they are super hungry. During hibernation, their body temperature drops drastically and their metabolism slows down. But there's a couple of problems with this theory. Allah said that he would turn them from left to right as if they were unable to do that themselves. During hibernation, they would probably be able to do that themselves as they would most likely go in and out of consciousness. If we were to walk in on them, we probably wouldn't imagine them to be awake unless their eyes were open, which would not be possible during hibernation. We would definitely not be terrified of this scenario, because it's nothing unusual looking enough to terrify people sleeping with their eyes closed and being asleep for 300 years in this state. They would slowly die of starvation. Well, they would wake up because they would need to eat. It's too long of a time, a couple of weeks possibly, if we ever crack the technicalities of human hibernation. But centuries? Massively unlikely. The final problem is that they would age a lot in 300 years, even with hibernation. They would not have lasted that long. So a lot does not add up. There is a reason why human hibernation is not possible. For our bodies to hibernate, it needs to be cold enough. Our hearts won't be able to withstand the cold. It would stop working. So again, we are left with a lot of boxes unticked when we look at the checklist. The sleepers probably wouldn't have survived the trip to begin with. It would be a different story if their hearts were frozen instantly and not just cold during a lengthy process. But either way, there's no mention of cold weather inside the chapter. So there's no point of talking about this, right? Wait, hang on a second. Is there really no mention of the cold? Let's take a look again. The sun rose and set, leaving the cave out of its path in a way that we don't physically understand. But what we do understand for certain is that this would mean that the cave was in the shade. And what would happen to us if there was no sun? If the sun never rose on us, we would freeze. This brings us to our third theory of the people of the cave, cryosleep. Cryosleep is a type of body preservation. When a person's internal organs just shut down and get preserved in a low temperature environment, freezing in fact, they would be asleep until their body temperature goes back to normal and they wake up, unaged, and they would have traveled into the future. It's an amazing way to travel into interstellar space. If we were ever able to achieve the technical factors of cryosleep, we could travel into distant planets without aging. But we are in the end times, and most likely we will never be able to do this. Some human beings have tried to do this though. They call it cryonics. Cryonics is slightly different from cryosleep. In the field of cryonics, Currently, there are actually people in big liquid nitrogen cylinders who opted to die to later be brought back to life, trying to play God as some do. With cryosleep, a person wouldn't have to die first. What's the difference between the two? Well, instead of the obvious that when a person dies, that person is dead and there's no coming back to Earth, as it is in the case of cryonics. Of course, we are not talking about miracles from Allah when he brings people back to life as he allowed Jesus, peace be upon him, to bring a man back from the dead. We are talking about the rule, not the exception. Within the laws of physics, humans haven't figured out how to safely freeze a human. But Allah is not human, is he? So for him, the creator, the designer, the all-knowing. Allah obviously knows how to do it. How to preserve our earthly bodies safely with cryosleep. So humans are trying to preserve other humans with cryonics to come back into the distant future when technology becomes more advanced. Some of them even just have their heads preserved with no bodies. So they thought when the time comes to get revived and come back to life, their head would then get attached to a new body or like a robot body, and they will live again. Our guess is they won't come back, obviously. When you're gone, you're gone, 
and you will wake again for sure, just not on this earth, and not on the sixth throne day. When you wake, it will be the seventh throne day, judgment day. So the cave, it would seem that Allah has done all this naturally, and also while the people of the cave were alive. They didn't die first, they were not revived, they were asleep, cryosleep. Allah goes on to say that you would think they are awake, but they are asleep. So scholars derived from this that their eyes must be open. Yes, this fits well with the cryosleep theory. Allah then says that we have moved them from left to right. We don't know how Allah does this exactly, but the why is obvious, so that their weight is evenly distributed throughout their sleep, so the body is preserved well. Or one side would be bruised and possibly crushed after 300 years of lying there with all that pressure of their own weight, and they wouldn't have survived. Their movement would not make much sense if they were completely frozen solid, so it is possible that their body temperature was lowered substantially to freezing, but not so much that they were completely frozen solid inside a bulk of ice, because if they were completely frozen solid in ice, there wouldn't be any need to move them. Then Allah says, and that if you were to walk in on them, seeing them in that state would be frightening and you would run away terrified, frozen, with their eyes wide open. A frightening scene for anyone. And when they wake 309 years into the future, they would have travelled through time. And they would be very hungry indeed. Cryosleep ticks all the boxes. Back to the lesson. Trust in Allah when the Dajjal appears, just as these young men put their trust in Allah, and Allah will do wondrous things to protect us. Wait. There is another hidden lesson, but it was just hiding in plain sight. Hold on, explorers. It's not over yet. There's something else. There's something there that we didn't think of. Another major link. By linking the story of the people of the cave, to the Dajjal. The story is not just about having faith when the trial of the Dajjal comes. There's more to it. The story is about time. The story about where it felt like a day or part of a day had passed by inside a cave, but 300 years went by on earth. Where are we going with this? Don't you see? It's not just guidelines of what to do. It's secret knowledge about it all about why Allah linked the story of the cave to the Dajjal. Not just what happened to the people of the cave, not just what to do when Dajjal arrives. It's a direct connection of what is happening to the Dajjal, that the Dajjal is alive on an island, right now, and has been alive for a very long time, relatively. The Dajjal is being preserved, and he is not ageing compared to the rest of the earth. There's that awesome theory of time dilation. As we live and breathe, just like the people of the cave, the lost island of the Jal is travelling through time.